My name is Joel Bourne. I'm a contributing writer here at National Geographic, and I've worked on a number of these food stories uh, over the past few years. And um, like many of Dennis Demick and Chris Johns, uh, was a was a farm kid who got an agronomy degree and decided to go into journalism instead, which I never thought would serve me quite as well as it has. But um, it was an interesting interesting track. So it's our panel, however, today talks about the real nuts and bolts of this sustainability. You know, how are we going to get to 2050, feeding everybody adequately without destroying the planet? And um, this is a funny, uh, sustainability is a funny word. I was interviewing Jeff Moyer. I think we said some Rodale folks were here. Jeff was the farm manager at the Rodale Institute and the f former chairman of the National Organic Standard Boards when it first came out. And he said, you know, I hate this word sustainability. I just don't, because if someone came, af af came to you and said, how's your marriage? And you said, well, ah, sustainable. <laughs> um, you'd go, I'm so sorry for you. So, so this whole concept of sustainability, we're going to try to flesh out here tonight. And we've got a fantastic panel to do it. Uh, let me introduce them to you. I'm going to start with our only bearded one over here, Mr. Jerry Glover, Dr. Jerry Glover, who's a senior sustainable agricultural systems advisor for USAID. Now, on, on Jerry's bio webpage, he says, according to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Survey, agriculture is now the number one human threat to global biodiversity and ecosystem function. 70% of Earth's farmland is planted with annual crops that are the main cause of the problem. And uh, Jerry has spent his career working to develop perennial grains, first with the legendary Wes Jackson at the Land Institute in Kansas, and now is uh, with USAID. Uh, he's a former National Geographic explorer in residence, and we were very delighted to have him. Um, he has a PhD in soil science from Washington State, and uh, probably the biggest thing, he was named by the journal Nature, is one of the five crop researchers that could actually change the world. So we can all go home now. Jerry's here. Very good. Um, Nadine Azu, next to Jerry, is a global project coordinator at the Plant Production and Protection Division of FAO. Uh, she's authored or co-authored numerous publications for uh, the organization on topics that hit at the heart of this subject of sustainable agriculture, including how rice farmers in Southeast Asia can adapt to climate change, how to improve food systems to create a sustainable diet, and the state of the world's plant and genetic resources for food and agriculture. Uh, she's currently leading a wonderful project on the conservation and management of pollinators for sustainable ag. Uh, and this is critical, as many of you know, because uh, a third of the plants we eat depend on pollinators, including the fruits and vegetables that provide an enormous amount of our nutrition. Uh, and we also are very well aware that bees, in particular, are suffering from what seems to be uh, almost a global collapse in almost every continent. Um, so welcome, Nadine. Uh, ben Jordan, next to me, we're very delighted to have, is uh, Director of Supply Sustainability for the Coca-Cola Company, uh, one of the leading beverage companies in the world. Uh, ben has an undergrad and master's degree from MIT and a PhD in environmental policy from Georgia Tech. Uh, he's also on the adjunct faculty at Emory University and a reviewer for the Journal of Industrial Ecology. Uh, but growing up on a working peach farm in rural Georgia, I think, is his best credence. And he says where he learned his, his most uh, important life lessons. His grandfather was actually named Farmer of the Year in 1970 by Georgia Farmer Magazine. I love this uh, because as a former uh, field editor for the Peanut Farmer Magazine in North Carolina, this is quite an honor. <laughs> to be Farmer of the Year in your state is a big, big deal. Uh, ben now leads Coke's sustainable agriculture efforts, working with both farmers and upstream suppliers and processors to help develop more sustainably grown and processed ingredients for its products and to help reduce their carbon footprint. Both issues are critical to Coke's bottom line, and we heard about this earlier from one of the questioners. Um, half the raw material Coke buys are grown on a farm, including sugar, fruit, juices, coffee, tea, and of course, the very controversial high fructose corn syrup. Uh, droughts, floods, and water shortages have increasingly disrupted Coke's supply chain over the last decade. So this is an issue, a business issue, as well as one that's of personal interest to Ben. Uh, last, a man who really doesn't need an introduction to anybody who's a who considers himself even remotely a foodie in the world. Um, I think Chef Jose Andres is perhaps the only um, celebrity chef who can also claim to be a professor at Harvard University. Um, he's uh, a, been a phenomenal institution here in Washington, DC. But instead of other celebrity chefs who berate their underlings for sort of killing the souffle on TV, as they normally do, uh, he has used what he calls his status and his the power of food to help tackle some of the most pressing food problems today, 
such as global hunger, food security, nutrition education, and childhood obesity. A longtime affiliate of DC Central Kitchen, after visiting post-earthquake Haiti, uh, he launched the World Central Kitchen, a humanity group that focuses on building smart kitchens with clean cook stoves that helps create jobs and economic opportunities in some of these poorest and hungriest countries on the globe. Uh, he's culinary ambassador of the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, a member of the U.S. State Department's American Chef Corps, among many, many things. And a few years ago, he was named one of the 100 most influential people in the entire world. So thank you for being with us today, <laughs> Chef Andres. So I'd like to start this off by a question I hope this is big in y'all mind, as in your mind as it is in mine. What is this concept of sustainability, and what does it mean to you in terms of a sustainable diet, a sustainable supply line, sustainable agriculture on the production end. So Jerry, since you've worked with perennial crops in the past, and um, maybe you could give us your idea what is a, a good picture of what sustainable agriculture looks like. Well, I'll do my best, as it is a complex topic, as you pointed out. It is, it is great to be here at National Geographic, where I generally interact with more farm kids, former farm kids, than I did at land-grant universities. So that's a, a nice uh, <laughs> place to work from. Um, it's also great that National Geographic is covering this topic. Forty years ago, today I was sprawled out on my living room floor, you know, thumbing through National Geographic magazine. And in those 40 years, you know, we've experienced the sharpest declines of biodiversity, uh, land degradation, and so on. And yet, it's also farming that has provided most of the goods and services that, that improve our well-being globally. Our civilizations depend on it. The flip side of what was introduced as my bio, you know, the, 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 the bad part, 70% of ag covered in annuals, they're the problem. Well, they're also, though, the, the real source of, of our livelihoods, well-being, civilizations. So that's the existential dilemma that we really face today in terms of how do we maintain the food supply without degrading uh, further degrading the wildlife the, the, and the lands. And so sustainability to me really comes around to those complex factors. We must maintain the soil resource. Soil is non-renewable for the most part. It's in rare circumstances do we bring soil back in as rich a manner as what we found it originally. Most of the soil is uh, limited to one to two meters or in many cases, much less. Many regions of the world, it's eroding at tremendous rates. And in parts of the world, many parts of the world, we're mining nutrients at far faster rates than it's, they're being replaced. We harvest crops, the nutrients go off, go to urban areas, they're seldom returned. We often replace nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. But of course, our bodies rely on some 16 essential nutrients, just as plants do. We're re farmers are removing those in harvests of crops, and only a few of those are getting replaced. So long-term sustainability, we've got to take care of the soil resource. The, the perennial part comes in because our annual crops, the maize, rice, the, the maize, rice wheat, it provides all those calories for us, those function within just a fairly shallow depth of soil, leaving it vulnerable to erosion and so on. Perennial crops can actually tap into much deeper uh, pools of uh, nutrients, access more water to provide resilience against drought, and so on. So what we're looking at in terms of sustainability long-term for agriculture is developing perennial cropping systems that work very nicely with annual cropping systems as well. Uh, farmers around the world use perennial crops right now in terms of perennial forages like alfalfa. Uh, also, we see perennial uh, tree crops being used. Banana is a perennial, for example. Longer out, further out, uh, we might call it a blue sky project, is the development of perennial grain crops. There's now a, a, a global network of uh, scientists using the most modern genomic tools to, to develop perennial versions of our major grain crops that will function much more like the uh, natural vegetation that we've replaced with agriculture. So in terms of sustainability, protecting that soil resource so that we're not encroaching into new areas, further uh, hammering away at biodiversity, creating farming systems that function much more like the natural uh, ecosystems that we've replaced. Great, great. 
Nadine, why don't you take it and tell us uh, yeah. what it looks like from your yeah, perspective? Yeah, thanks. No, I, absolutely. I totally agree. Um, that's the very much the environment part. When we talk about sustainable agriculture, sustainable production, what, well, sustainable agriculture, we look at also many other different aspects. We look at the environmental aspect for sure. There's also the social and economic context that we need to look at, and also the policy and governance issues. Um, when listening to the presentation before uh, and on all the series of uh, National Geographic issues and all the major issues that we're now facing and we have been facing in the past, like climate change and rising temperatures and drought and rising food prices, these are all factors that we have to take into consideration when we think of sustainable agriculture. So we're looking at how we're producing the food, who's eating the food, how is the food being processed? How is it being transformed? How is it being delivered to markets? What are the conditions in which this is being undertaken? How does it get there? What are the energy costs involved in it? And how are we working with soil, with water, with ecosystem services, and with biodiversity, trying to manage the resources that we have in order to make the food that we eat healthy, and not just what we actually physically put in our mouth, but also ourselves in terms of when we're producing it, and also for the environment. Oh, excellent. All right, Ben, what do you think? From Coca-Cola perspective? Sure, sure. thanks. And, and again, echoing what others have said, thanks very much to National Geographic for having us here today. Building on what Jerry and Nadine have said about how we define sustainability, let me back up and, and talk a little bit about how Coca-Cola sees sustainability more broadly and then how we see sustainable agriculture fitting within that. Um, broadly speaking, we like to say that the health of our business, the sustainability of our business, we're only as healthy and sustainable as the communities where we operate. So there's very much a, a community-based focus in our sustainability work. We have an overall sustainability framework that's focused on personal well-being, social well-being, and environmental well-being. We call this the me for personal, we for social, and the world environmental, environmental well-being. Um, we've made 2020 goals and commitments around, uh, around each of those areas. Um, in, as I'm responsible for our sustainable agricultural commitments, I like to say that you know, there's no better place than a rural agricultural community to see where all of our sustainability issues come together. And really not just ours as a business, um, big focus areas like water and women and well-being, but also society's issues, right? And it's not just the environmental issues and the, the technical issues, but it's also the social the social piece as well. So we've made a global commitment that by 2020, we'll sustainably source 100% of our key agricultural ingredients. These are our main sweeteners, our main juices, and then a handful of other ingredients that make up about 95% of our global agricultural supply. As Joel said, about half of what we buy is inputs to our products and packaging is grown on a farm. Uh, many people outside the Coke business, even many people within the Coke business, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily connect to that or, or, or realize that. So we've done a lot of work to educate ourselves within our Coca-Cola system as well as our business partners on that fact um, right there. And we've defined a set of principles around human and workplace rights, environmental performance, and farm management systems that sort of make up our overall definition of, of what we see as sustainable agriculture or sustainably sourced. Uh, we've assessed those principles and a set of, of farm level criteria, 69 individual criteria or practices that we would expect at a farm level. We've assessed those against 19 existing third-party standards and certifications that are out there for agriculture um, and are in the process of rolling those out um, within our agricultural supply chain. Excellent. Excellent. So here I'm a chef. Um, it's funny because I believe they keep inviting me to these panels because I keep complaining that <laughs> they never invite chefs to these type of panels. <laughs> and we are people of the world. We are the ones ultimately feeding everybody. If you think about it, we are the ones connecting the goodness of the earth so what our farmers produce and the people that need to be fed. So I'm very happy that uh, chefs more and more are becoming spokespersons uh, about these issues. And so we're going to be talking about what sustainable means. And, and, and through my life experiences and this MBA that life is, um, I can be telling you that one for me is uh, very close to my heart, has to do with the environment, but not anymore in reference about how we grow the vegetables, how we grow our foods, but how do we cook our foods. And it's unbelievably, unbelievable to see that I'm a chef thanks to a stove, 
and the stove is opportunity. But at this moment, a stove, or the lack of a good stove, is what is creating many of the major problems around the globe. Let me explain you. Uh, 30,000 years ago, humanity was cooking with three rocks and wood. Today, in the 21st century, we have over a billion people in the world cooking with three rocks and wood. We're about to put men in Mars, and still, we've not been able to share the wealth of resources and technology we have to provide those men and women, especially women, the tools to be feeding their families. Why sustainability and a stove has everything to do? Well, uh, probably many of you are birds, but if not very quickly, uh, they have to be cutting trees. They cut trees used to have wood to feed their families. They are already spending energy before they cook the energy to feed their own families. In the process of feeding people, the, the women are right there with all the smoke going into their lungs. Use a health issue right there, only in the process of feeding their families. Because unfortunately, many of them, they don't have cribs right there. In that single moment, their children, before they are one year old, health issues for their chronic asthma for the rest of its life. In the process, they will send their daughters to hunt for wood around uh, the near forest. We uh, don't allow that young girl, that young woman, to get a proper education early on in her life because she has to be spending one hour a day just searching for that wood. In the process, things happen to her. In the process, because when the rain comes, instead of having healthy forests and healthy soils, the water runs down. Runs down, takes away all the fertile soil in places that they should be having great harvest. But because they are depleting the good soil and the soil is moving into the ocean, they will not have a proper harvest only because a simple cook stove is taking away uh, all that wood uh, that on, pa on paper is what is supposed to be supporting their uh, environment. Uh, that soil gets into the water. That water gets dirty. It's no reef, it's no coral, it's no baby fish, it's no fishing. So take a look for a second how we can be talking about what sustainability is. It's, we can be talking about pesticides. We can be talking about anything you want. But here, for a second, technology, a simple cook stove, an improved cook stove, or a clean cook stove can be the difference between having a world, especially the developed world, that actually will improve with a clean one on health, on the environment, on education, on making sure that savings, the, the smoke, the money that goes into the smoke, 30, 40% of their daily salaries goes into buying charcoal if they can afford it. Mm -hmm. So imagine the difference that all of a sudden, money doesn't equal the smoke, but money equals something that goes into their pockets to buy vegetables, to buy, to take care of the health of the family, to give proper education. So that's to, the, to me what uh, sustainability is today. Excellent. Well, now, while, we're, while we landed on, uh, on cooking and diet, Let's talk about that a little bit because we've we've touched on some of the main issues in production agriculture. But you know, consumption is what drives everything. It drives what the farmers grow, what the market uh, bears, what they can do. So many people come to me and say, "Well, look, if we were all vegetarians, or if we were, you know, if we all ate less meat, you know, the world we'd have a plethora of food. We wouldn't have this issue." What? does a sustainable diet look like? We were talking earlier, do we eat the farm salmon? Do we eat the wild caught salmon? Do we not eat salmon at all and just eat the sardines that are fed to the salmon? All these are really pressing issues and affect everything down the line. So Jose, if you could continue a little bit, what does a sustainable diet look like to you? Are we gonna, are you, are we, are you putting out vegetarian restaurants down the road or, or, <laughs> or a cookbook that shows us how to eat light on the planet? What, what's the? Okay, for the record, in, in August I'm opening in Vegas a restaurant called Meat. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody said, but three years ago in 60 Minutes, you said, meat is overrated. The future of humanity are sexy vegetables. Sexy vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is that uh, I don't think it should be a fight between one and another. I can share with you, as a chef, how I try to feed my people, as a father, how I feed my family, and then how I like to feed myself. Um, I believe what's happening in the restaurants and in the food industry um, is going to be very much what we are going to be influencing, especially the big food companies, because they have huge power to influence. I will say chefs, one at a time, we have huge influence. So in order to know what's the most sustainable diet, um, 
we're going to have to have kind of a very 360. We are not going to be imposing to the people of the world what we want people to eat. Uh, it's going to have to be a lot of education in the process. One of the best things has happened uh, um, uh, in, in America in the last few years is how every day it seems we have uh, uh, more and more farmers markets, thank you, Anne, um, across America. Uh, farmers markets is not only a beautiful idea to bring the farmer used to the city and all of a sudden, wow, a carrot looks like this. It's not a cube in a plastic <laughs> cabane. So, a farmer's market to a degree is this amazing way. It's a marketing PR that comes directly from the land far away from the city um, now where everyone lives all to its heart. So when you ask me about um, what's the restaurant of the future, um, I foresee that we're going to be seeing fast food restaurants where 100% are going to be vegetables because we all know that the vegetable base diet, like Michael Pollan has been already preaching for many years, is where it's going to be best, not for environment, but for us? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. So do big food companies are going to have a huge influence in somehow convincing and moving its marketing money and its marketing dollar into that situation? Why? Because it's good and actually it's tasty. What we have to do is make sure that we create this army that begins cooking vegetables, no like, imagine the problem, right? You go to a meat, a steakhouse, and what happened with the vegetables? Side dish. <laughs> Heck, in my world, they're gonna move next to the meat courses, and the vegetables are gonna be as important. This may be a small gesture. Bigger gesture will be I open 10,000 fast food restaurants where 100% of the menu will be vegetables. That will be a great idea. That will be a contribution. But again, you cannot force people but only we have to be making sure that we work in what really people need and start using the technology, the marketing, and the know-how of chefs that we have spread all around the world to make sure that we are able to somehow tell them, telling them that diet that you know inside you that is the right one to feed the people, I'm gonna do an effort really to bring it forward. Today, my restaurant, some of them, 55% of the menu is all vegetable. And I'm not doing it because I'm imposing. I see people more and more going towards that. Now, I have to give them the opportunity to eat the way they know is the way they wanna eat. That's all. Okay. Well, let, let's, let's talk to the big food company now. So from, from Coke's standpoint, we all love sugary drinks. We all love, you know, sodas. I grew up on them in the South, you know. There was, used to be a big billboard outside of Atlanta that said Coke. It's not just for breakfast anymore. <laughs> right? Oh nice product God. placement. So, so you know that you're, you know, there's some issues, there's some nutritional issues going on with your product. So, I mean, how do you, how do you move the ball forward to create a sustainable snack food or sustainable soft drink or something that um, is both going to be healthy and all, but also for people, but also healthy for the planet? Well, and I would echo a lot of what Chip Andre said and Jack before me in the token corporate chair here um, <laughs> but 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 the reality is you know c consumers demand a lot of things right um, and I would say you know our our beverage portfolio is expanding every day we have over 500 brands globally all of our beverages can be part of a healthy balanced diet right um, but, can be part but, of but, but it's a mat it's a matter of balancing the calorie intake, right, with the exercise that you that you do, you know, and what have you. Um, so, so moving forward, you know, if if I were to guess, I would see like like Chef Andre, you know, more choice, more diversity out there in terms of the portfolio. Um, I think that that's going to be a demand that consumers put on all food and beverage companies. Do you see a shift from more these more healthier juices away from the the more traditional soft drink? If you look across our beverage portfolio, and, and I mentioned the agricultural ingredients that are part of, of our sustainable agriculture commitment. So we have our main sweeteners, and we have our main juices, coffee and tea as well. Um, certainly, some of, our, some of our, our beverages are growing faster right, than, than others. Um, I would say you know, our juice portfolio is certainly growing. Uh, coffee and tea are, are areas that we're getting into more and more, as well as dairy. Mm. Nating, from the FAO perspective, you work. You yeah, look at no, a lot I'd of small farmers. And <laughs> yeah, so I know that I know that there's this divide. You know, in the United States, we're looking at quality, and in many parts of the world, they're just trying to find quantity. So, yeah. yeah well, what's no, your idea of a sustainable diet? Yeah, thanks. No, because I was listening to 
these conversations with interest. I know my sister, who's vegetarian, would be very happy for your revised menu. <laughs> but, well, um, this was off the record, oh? Don't tweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the fact of the matter is that there are, what is it, say 842 million people who are chronically undernourished. Um, there are, I believe if the stat is right, 26% of children, this is globally, are stunted and 36 <coughs> lack vitamin A. That, that causes blindness. And these, these are children. So the figures are quite large. A sustainable diet is a healthy diet. It's a diet that provides you with the right balance of macronutrients, protein, carbohydrate, and it also provides you with the micronutrients, so with the vitamins and the minerals. Sustainable part of a, the definition of a sustainable diet is also looking at how you produce the food, so respecting the environment with as least environmental impact as possible. But the point is that the diet has to be healthy in order to be sustainable for people to be able to continue living. Um, as you were giving the example of the stove, it's actually also a the food itself, to be able to have livelihoods and live healthy lives. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting is that we should be looking also at the global trends because the pattern of food consumption is likely to change because projections of figures are saying that livestock production is going to increase because there's going to be a greater demand for animal-based food. So that's another consideration that we have to look at when we're looking at linking sustainable diets and sustainable agriculture in terms of agricultural production. I'm kind of dragging this out just to bring up some other issues that I think could fit into the whole discussion. So looking at what the trends in food production are globally, looking at what is missing in diets and what, what needs to be provided in terms of sustainable diet and also linking it to broader environmental issues. So in essence, a uh, sustainable diet is a healthy diet. Excellent. So, Jerry, I'm, I'm going to let you do that as well. But since Nadine brought up this, uh, the idea of vitamin A deficiency, let's talk about the, the we talked a little bit about GMOs earlier. But let's talk about GMOs and the ability to actually create sustainable agriculture. We've got this golden rice out there. It's very controversial. Um, it has the potential to uh, address at least some of this. Is there a role? for this type of technology in, in creating a more sustainable planet and not just selling more Roundup or, um, or BT cotton? Well, uh, on the GMO issue, in some, in some ways, that's kind of old news. There are a lot of biotechnology tools, and really uh, plant breeders, farmers, have been using so-called biotechnology for 10,000 years in modifying uh, the crops and the traits that, that they rely on to get good yields. The new genomics tools that uh, Jonathan and, and Dennis talked about earlier offer whole new opportunities to improve plants in much the same, uh, in, in some ways, in the same way as GMO technologies did, but relying on conventional and breeding to bring to, to, to make use of the natural variation within the plants. This is a long-winded way of saying GMOs in, in the world uh, that we're facing is actually in some ways a small issue. There are obviously concerns about corporate control of our food systems. Those are, those are valid arguments. But in terms of a tool, it should be on the table. And I think uh, we're going to be seeing new ways to use those that benefit farmers more in the future. Th that's fine. There's a whole, it's one uh, tool out of many that we can use. And so I, I think that, you know, we should rely, we should use it when, whenever, it's, whenever it's useful and when possible. The, these concerns about uh, corporations controlling our food supply, you know, those are great conversations, but I, I agree very much with Dan Glickman's statement. I'd hate to see these tools taken off the shelf. Uh, and I have high hopes that there are new tools on, on the horizon, and actually in many cases being used right now, that are less controversial, that'll reap the same benefits. Right. Well, I know when does I was that address your your question? <laughs> yeah, it does okay. in a bit. And um, and uh, but I want to I do want to touch back on the rice in a little while. But I remember when I was in ag school, you know, they were all a borlog even was talking like we're going to make 
uh, put corn, rhizomes on our corn plants. So every poor farmer in the world is going to get 100 pounds of nitrogen for his plants. And this stuff is going to do it. GMO is going to do it. And here we are 25 years later. And I was interviewing you know, the head of Monsanto. And he's like, yeah, we're not really working on that. You know, we're working on nitrogen efficiency, and we're doing a little bit better. But these big sort of substantial things that were the promise of this technology just never seem to. Well, uh, I, and let me address that. You know, if, if we're only investing in science that really uh, pans out, we're definitely not being risky enough. You know, uh, I'm, I'm so supportive of Dan Glickman's call for more investment in agricultural research. We should be investing in a broad spectrum of research trajectories, not all of which are going to pan out. And you know, uh, thankfully, we have you know a, a, a world with many visionaries that attempt these things. Some of them don't pan out, but even those that don't fully pan out, uh, you know, create. Uh, uh, side benefits that are useful. The, the development of these genomics tools often are the result of many failures in the lab and in the field from the past. Uh, so you know, research successes are more the result of many uh, research failures than they are of just one single linear process to success. So we have to keep in mind a low-risk research portfolio is doomed to failure when you compare it to one that's much more broadly invested in. And when are we going to harvest perennial grains? Well, uh, you know, Malawi farmers, uh, the, the, the work of uh, Michigan State University and others in uh, Malawi to develop um, systems that rely more fully on longer season, longer duration pigeon peas, where you get multiple harvests off of them. That's a, that's a great early stage perennial grain. Grain legumes are high in nutrients, uh, high, in, high in these minerals that that uh, create health problems when they're deficient. So already, farmers are using early types of perennial versions of grain legumes. Uh, USAID currently is funding a relatively small project of looking at some of the perennial grain developed at um, uh, the Land Institute in Kansas and uh, uh, University of Georgia, looking at how it might fit into the farming systems in Mali, farming systems in Ethiopia bringing in more uh, resilience to climate change, more resilience to drought. So it's, it's, it's also the work, the, the result of some failures of the past, people learning from those fails, failures of the past, refining the research uh, focus, refer, refining those tools. Chef Andre? Are you, I mean, you going to have a GMO on your menu and a non-GMO? Yeah, a, a full restaurant <laughs> where I will declare that this is GMO, and then if people want to go, they can go. And if people don't want, they will not go. This is one of the things that many people are asking is, why are those companies that control that technology, which are a handful, quite frankly, why they are really opposing so much? If now, for many years, we've been putting in our food the calorie content, the, the vitamin content, why we cannot start really telling the American public or the world if they're using GMO? or no GMO ingredients. This will be first. I believe the public is demanding this, and I would like eventually that these own companies will be the ones saying, OK, we're giving up. You know, when I was young, I saw the little shop of horrors, right? And my, <laughs> my mother had a little cactus there next to my window. And I swear to God, I always thought that this plant was going to wake up at night and eat me alive. <laughs> uh, are we going into that direction? Listen, I've been spending a lot of time in Haiti, Cambodia. I see hunger. I see hunger. I see hunger in Washington. But the truth is that if I was God and I need to feed 9 billion people in 20, 30 years, uh, I will agree with uh, Mr. Glickman that we need to have all the opportunities open for everybody. But also what I would say is let's make sure that we level down the ground. And if we are giving subsidies to the big companies for research or uh, tax breaks and benefits for X amount of uh, uh, different things they grow. Let's make sure we give the same breaks to the small farmers of America and to the small farmers of the world. Let's make sure we level down the field so the small farmers, because we saw what happened with the bank industry, right? The banks were too big to fail, but the economy fell. The government, our money, had to come to put cash to cover the losses 
of those people that were leading our economy. This is not money that can be printed tomorrow. This is food that cannot be produced one day to another. So if we are creating a system that we have few companies that we will create the too big to fail, if one day something happens, if they genetically modify something happens, that we have a plague of insects, that we have uh, unforeseen fungus that grows and wipes out the entire corn production and soybean of the world because we are so sure that this crop is so powerful that nothing will ever damage. Imagine for a second that that happens. Then we will know the meaning of hunger. And so I will believe that it will be better to level down the field. Let's have as many GMO big companies producing X amount of crops, but let's empower the small farmer community of the world because we will always, we all be a lot safer if we are able to achieve this kind of two types of farmers, the big ones and the small ones. That will be safety for America and safety for the world. Excellent. We got about five minutes Sorry. before we're going to go to questions, but how do we do that? How, well, do you, how do you subsidize sustainability? Well, I think one thing is, uh, as was pointed out in the previous panel, we've disinvested in public uh, agricultural research. We've handed much of it off to the private industry, and, and we've seen the results. Some results are good, but others, uh, as, as has been pointed out, are, are negative. One of the best ways to level the playing field is, to, is for the American public to get reinvested personally in our agricultural system and, re and support the reinvestment of our agricultural research uh, uh, scientists around the country. There are very few public plant breeders left anymore and that creates real problems when we're trying to address very uh, urgent agricultural problems around the world. We just don't, in, in some cases, we don't have enough talent out there that's well trained. And uh, over, the, over the years, you know, Private investment in agriculture has overshadowed uh, our public investment. For some reason, we've always felt, we've recently felt that private companies can do better than public organizations. I personally think it's a, a, a big mistake to disinvest in our agricultural research. Right, and I think the number is every $1 invested in basic agricultural research is, gets a $10 return. I mean, it's something yeah, phenomenal. It's, it's a no-brainer. It's a great return on your investment. Right. All right. Well, from, from Coke's perspective, how do, you, how do you incentivize that? You guys carry a big marketing stick. How do you, how do you make that work? Can, can I come back around to that? Sure. Something sure. That, that was said, I think on this issue of, of large-holder farmers versus small-holder farmers, I think, I think ultimately we've got to all prove together that sustainably sourced is as possible on a one-acre farm as it is on 15,000, right? You know, and, and the reality is certain things are different at scale right than, than they are at, at a small scale and, and we've got to I got we've got to figure that out right and I think there's some good examples around the world where co-ops and other farmer associations have have come around to collectively farming areas together in a way that gets some of the benefits of scale without you know losing the, the smallholder right and the benefit to the smallholder farmer so I think that's something that that we've got to got to work on I think you know our um, our, you know, we don't generally buy directly from farmers. We buy through the food processing, food supply companies. There's many as seven steps between us and a farm, um, right? But more and more, you know, every day we're getting more and more engaged in agriculture. Um, th there's a, um, you know, some examples in China, you know, for example, where um, 20,000 farmers might be supplying one sugar mill, or 60,000 farmers might be supplying one. One, uh, one corn mill, right, for high fructose corn syrup. You know, an example was, was brought out earlier around cell phones and cell phone technology. One of our um, sugar mills in China, as a way to let the farmers know that they're ready to take in some sugar, they need sugar, they send out an SMS text to 20,000 farmers, and then the farmers come in and, and deliver their sugar, right? So, so there's, I don't know, there's a big difference between large scale and small scale, between the U.S., between China, and I think we've got to we've got to understand the realities of of different um, places around the world. Um, different ingredients are different, right? You know, as we've gone down our path with our our 14 ingredients that I mentioned and those sustainably sourced, um, you know, sorts of goals, we've built global roadmaps at the ingredient level for each of those 14 roadmaps to 2020 in terms of how we think we'll get to sustainable. And then we've double clicked down into the priority sourcing regions for those, uh, for those individual ingredients. But 
we've got to understand that you know, corn in the upper Midwest is fundamentally different from corn in, in the northeast of China, and it may still be different in 2020. Um, so there might be different things that are needed. Now on the issue of incentives to farmers, we believe everyone needs to benefit in that process. We don't, we can't be seen, nor you know, we we can't put in more stringent requirements for farmers um, that disproportionately impact the smallholder farmer. We absolutely believe that everyone has to be incentivized and everyone has to win across the supply chain for it to be possible. Okay, so more basic research, more more incentives to all across big and small, and more vegetarian restaurants. And please, but one last thing, po tell us briefly before we go to questions about the pollinator issue, because I know a lot of people in the audience are probably concerned about the status, and how do we, how do we address that in terms of the incentive? You actually, no, I want, yeah, I just want to pick up on some of the things. Oh. I think one thing, and I'm glad that Danielle mentioned it in the first panel, is the role mm -hmm. of smallholders and the agricultural practices that they are, that they are using, because there are practices, good, uh, agricultural practices that use the environment, use the natural resources as inputs, try to manage external inputs as best as possible to improve their crop productivity, and, it, and they work. One of the, well, since we're on the subject of bees. <laughs> mm. But there are agricultural practices, for example, for the management of pollination. Some of the management practices do involve looking at reducing pesticides, so you're addressing the pesticides issue planting hedgerows and different crops, and you're addressing crop diversity, which, by the way, I want to say links absolutely to what you're saying about the resilience of a system. That's something that's really, really important, having a resilient ecosystem and a resilient agroecosystem. The more resilient it is, the stronger we are in the face of climate change, the better we are prepared and have the tools to adapt to it. So all of these things are interconnected. And how do we, and the two systems that are being described, like the the large production and the smaller production, I think there's a conversation that can be had between the two. I think there are a lot of lessons that can be found in smallholder farming that can be upscaled to large-scale farming. Again, pollination management, there are some options that could be explored. Excellent, some, excellent. Sorry well, to go well, off let's topic, but I did want to mention that. And working with at the technical level and linking it up to policy level, that to answer the last question. Very good, very good. All right, now let's have a conversation with our audience. Um, microphones, microphones. Are they wandering around? We have a lady down here who um, has a question, raised her hand. Uh, sort of in the middle. Hi, I'm Ann Yonkers uh, from Fresh Farm Markets, and thanks, Jose, for that nice call out. Uh, I think one of the things that people don't realize is happening is that all the research that Dan Glickman talked about and the need for sort of systematic research, I see ha a lot of that has been transferred to farmers markets, to the farmers who are selling in farmers markets. So in a way, when people come to farmers markets and spend maybe what they think is a little bit more money for their food than they're used to spending, what they're doing is supporting the research that the small farmers are doing in terms of learning how to grow things sustainably. So it's a, you know, it's, I just see, one of the things I've seen in, in the 17 years I've been doing this is that in those years, the amount of creative innovation, technological innovation, and sort of plant and seed research that's going on in the individual farms that not, not are just in our markets, but all over the country, is amazing. And I think that it's sort of, it's completely underground. People don't understand how much is really happening there. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, do you, Medina, I know you work with small farm. Is the farmer-led research movement um, creating benefits uh, in, in other parts of the world? For, for research? Yeah. It is, yeah. Yeah, That's the short answer. Okay. Did you have yeah. a, uh, sure it, yeah. So you were right. You no, were right but, all along. No, but there's also, for example, we work, we work with farmer field schools in smallholder communities. Mm. And that's, that's a, an approach where you're on the ground with the farming communities. You've trained a trainer before, and, they, and it's a member of the community. There's a whole process you have to go through. And basically, it's the, the farmers together on, 
on the plot, on a site, doing experiments and observing what's happening in the field. That in itself is a form of research, and so they're applying it to their own field. Uh, in, yeah. in Haiti, in a place called Palmistan P, uh, I have there a canteen, and we wanted to help uh, cover uh, extra vegetables to, to add to the rice and beans that we get through WFP, and, and I wanted to do a farm. And so I made the locals buy the land in exchange for myself bringing know-how, equipment, seeds, etc. And I went to plant cabbage because they love cabbage in Haiti. And they say it's never going to grow here. It's not enough water and it's too warm. The cabbage only grows up higher up in a village called Forêt de Pan, where much of the cabbage in Haiti is produced. Well, I said, what are we going to waste? Time and seeds. We did it. We planted. We've been through our second harvest. And already, the uh, people around their homes, you can see that they are planting the same cabbage seeds, and they are putting a little bit of glass of water every day. So this is the kind of uh, research that also can be happening in faraway places like, like Haiti, with only the idea and trying can have huge impact, even in this case at the very small scale, scale one family at a time. But nonetheless, uh, this, you can call this is research too. Sure, it can make a huge difference. We've got a question from Twitter here. Uh, yeah, this question comes from Evan Wooderson, and he says, uh, I'd love for the panel to discuss the feasibility of urban vertical farming in a sustainable food future. Wow. This is great. That's a big one. Jerry? Well, the you know, I, you read a lot about this. Um, and ur urban farming and urban gardening, I think, is a great thing for multiple reasons. Lifestyle changes that it, it often uh, results in. Uh, greater access to um, important vegetables for some urban communities. In terms of supplying the global calories needed, it's um, probably not going to play much of a role. Most of our calories come from br what we might call broad fields, these larger uh, landscapes that produce the, uh, the protein and calorie rich uh, grains that we primarily rely on, that, that's extremely unlikely to change. We can change what those crops look like, and we can likely change how they pr function in, the, in that ecosystem. But we're probably not, I think it's very unlikely over the next 40 years at least that we're going to substantially shift our calorie producers from grains and legumes to something else. Um, so, you know, it's just, you know, capturing sunlight capturing water and the, and the soil nutrients, it's not easy to do in a vertical farming system. You've got to so often supply the light. You have to supply the nutrients rather artificially. And uh, the water, you can manage uh, pretty well. You know, that, that's less of an issue maybe. But our calories are going to come from the broader landscapes of our rural areas. I, I don't see any way around it. To make, maybe make a comment on that. I absolutely agree. I, I live in a, a suburb within the city of Atlanta, and I see a lot of this focus around local and you know urban farming and, and what have you. I feel like I feel like there are a lot more people engaged in conversations about food because of that. And so I think if we yeah. can grab a hold of that as a yeah. benefit yeah. of that movement to drive a broader conversation about what the bigger picture global issues are, yeah. I think that would be great. The other day I was very excited because I met this young farmer who is actually helping me have a little farm in front of my house, um, that he's looking to do a one acre farm on top of the building. And I was very uh, empowered with him. He told me, I have no doubt that one day, every single rooftop in every single building in every single in America will have a garden. And he was, he knew what he was talking about. So I cannot wait and look forward what he's about to do. I used to be crazy. How many of you have a lawn in front of their home? That's a matter how small it is. Well, I do have one. You know how much money I spend planting a stupid grass every day? <laughs> so my neighbors don't think I'm this kind of you know, immigrant that doesn't take care of his lawn. <laughs> <laughs> so just for a second, not like I'm going to stop going to farmer's markets, which I love, but I thought if every single lawn in every single home that we spend so much money in keeping. We're able to transform it into a farm itself. Wouldn't be a very cool use of a very expensive piece of land in the middle of the city, right? So anyway, it's only food for thought. Uh, are we going to be feeding humanity through this process? Maybe no, but something like this can keep 
making us think and keep connected to the importance of farming to keep this land of ours alive. Maybe that's enough uh, Absolutely. of an idea of why to do it. I always thought we have, we have plenty of golf courses we can plow up whenever we're ready. <laughs> so it's my favorite. All right, let's have one from way over here. Yes. Thank you very much. Is it this one? Jenny DeVoy, University of Maryland, College of Agriculture. One of the aspects of food uh, sustainability that we talk a, a, about a lot in our university is food safety. How do you produce sustainable agriculture and also propagate the knowledge about su food safety practices? You can produce a, an entire storage shed of corn and have to toss it if you decide to test it. But do you decide not to test it because you might find that it's not fit for human consumption. So we're putting ethical questions now on the shoulders of a lot of people, uh, but we're forgetting to integrate that in our discussions about sustainability. You can produce quantity, but is it going to be something that the population can eat? Wow, fantastic question about food safety and food quality. Anybody want to handle uh, that? Well, just to say, you know, USA definitely recognizes that as a critical part. We make a lot of investments in uh, nutrition, in the nutritional aspects of the production systems. And that includes working to ensure that contaminants such as aflatoxins aren't in the food. Y you mentioned that oftentimes the food is thrown out because it's not fit for humans' consumption. Actually, in many parts of the world, the smallholder farmers, the women and children, are eating that food that's contaminated with fungal toxins, uh, fungal pathogens. And so it is a very important, that's, you know, when we talk about the integration of this diet, you know, for mu much of the world, the bottom billion, it's not, th these are not choices. These are absolute essential items. For those of us, other billion living mostly on our bottoms and overfed, these are just lifestyle choices largely. But these people integrating nutrition with the productivity as well as the livelihoods of cooking, uh, fuel wood harvesting or procurement, these are all integrated issues that uh, are key to sustainability. When we talk about productivity, we have to talk about all that. But nutrition and food safety are critical issues. Yeah. Food, yeah, food safety is definitely an issue. For example, if there are three conventions that deal with um, chemicals. That's one aspect of food safety. And uh, I believe it's 70% are pesticides and used in agriculture. So definitely that's, that's one of the issues. Um, we also have the Codex Alimentarius, which deals with food safety issues. And it is an issue that we deal with at FAO. No. Sounds like storage, too, is another yeah, big no, it, Yeah, no, yeah, it's definitely. OK, I think that's all we have time. We've, uh, we've tried your patience enough. Thank you so much. You've been wonderful to see so many people here asking such great questions and, and so involved. And thank you again to our wonderful panelists. Thank you.